Blue Water Sailboat, a tour of the Valiant 40, part one. My name is Patrick Childress on the Sailboat Brick House. I have had a lot of requests to do a boat tour of our Valiant 40. So this will be a two-part series. The first part will be covering the on deck and the cockpit areas. And then part two will go down below and see what's there. The Valiant 40 first came out in 1973. It was designed by a radical thinker at that time named Robert Perry. It was believed that any boat sailing across oceans, or especially around the world, had to be extremely heavy. And at that time, the idea was using a double ender. That is where the stern is almost or equally as pointy as the bow. The idea there was the Moses effect. So if you're running ahead of big waves out in a storm, waves will come up from behind and just part around that stern, and you'll keep on going without broaching. There's a number of problems with that. Without that reserve buoyancy in the back, that stern can get depressed and waves can also wash right over onto the boat. Also, when you're hard on the wind, there's the lack of reserve buoyancy to keep the bow down and the stern gets depressed. So you start hobby horsing out in these large waves when you're hard on the wind. Hobby horsing is the rocking fore and aft of a boat. In coverages, when more modern design boats are sitting still, many, but not all, the lender will start hobby horsing fore and aft, fore and aft. So Robert Perry designed a canoe stern. This is a much fuller stern, much more buoyancy in the back, and I still get a little bit of hobby horsing when we're hard on the wind in certain wave patterns. I notice that it slows us down some, but overall it's a very good compromise, especially when we're running with the wind in big waves. We aren't slewed around nearly as much as what a more modern boat would be with a much bigger, broader stern. So every boat is a compromise. Some people love their double enders, that's great. Um, I like our canoe stern, but also the bottom of this Valiant 40 was a radical departure from those earlier designs because the earlier designs had a full keel. So they're very stable boats when you're crossing oceans, but it's a lot of wetted surface. It slows the boat down. This boat with the modified keel is much more nimble. It's far easier to get in and out of marinas, especially when there's a wind and a current. With a less wetted surface, at the time when the Valiant 40 was launched, it was a very nimble, fast boat. And when I also say nimble, I mean light. At that time, this was considered a light displacement boat. Now, because of more modern designs and building materials, the Valiant 40 would be more along a moderate displacement boat. The one thing that I don't like about this boat is its reversing capabilities. This boat, when I put the gear shift into reverse, it always goes off to starboard no matter what. The only way I can straighten the boat out and have some kind of steering abilities is to put the gear shift into neutral and then coast. As long as that prop isn't turning, washing over the hull, then I do have steering in reverse. If you go to the Kiwi Prop site and read about their ideas of prop walk, which is a big mis misnomer, it should be called hull walk. And that is where the wash of a prop washes over a curved surface in reverse and then causes the boat to turn off to one side or the other. There's other designs that'll back up like a car, just like this boat here. It has a fairly flat bottom. The prop is just out in the middle by itself, and that boat, will you'll be able to parallel park in reverse, just like you're pulling a car into a dock. My Valiant 40, it takes a lot of finessing to do anything like that, especially if there's a wind or any kind of a current involved. It gets to be very challenging and actually kind of fun, as long as you don't bash up anybody else's boat. <laughs> So let's go forward and start at the bow, the pointing end, and uh, we'll work our way back from there. On the bow of the Valiant 40, it's set up with a double bow roller assembly to carry two anchors. Back in the 1970s, anchor technology was certainly not what it is today. You needed two anchors back then. When we set off from the U.S. and were anchoring in the Bahamas, we relied on this CQR plow anchor. In 10 feet of water, with 100 feet of chain out, this CQR dragged a long farmer's furrow through a turtle grass bed. That's when we switched over to the Bruce anchor. The Bruce anchor was a far superior anchor. 
and we used that for many years, but it did drag twice on us, both over very smooth coral. And we felt like if it had a more pointy end, it would have done a better job. So we advanced with the anchor technology and eventually put on a Manson anchor. This is one of the latest, greatest anchors. It has done extremely well for us. We're very pleased with it. Unfortunately, the Manson will not fit on the bow roller along with the Bruce anchor. I'd love to have kept the Bruce anchor. The only thing that'll fit is this old, not so desirable CQR anchor. Ocean crossing, I'll take off the CQR and move it way back here by the front of the coach roof and put it on a thick pad and then strap it down with lines going port and starboard. That'll help to get some of the weight aft, but also if we're plowing into big waves, that's a lot of force of waves across these anchors. So I wanna minimize all of that friction up on the bow. Now this bow roller assembly was about 40 years old and it looked fine, nice shiny stainless steel, but we've had our bad experiences with good looking stainless steel falling apart. So we decided just to be cautious and replace it. And this new bow roller assembly is made out of grade five titanium. Titanium is an incredible metal. Grade five titanium is three and a half times stronger than 316 stainless steel. Yet it weighs just a little bit more than half as much. If you hold it in your hand, it feels like a piece of aluminum. Nothing affects grade five titanium in the marine environment. And that's the same metal as these chain plates and the clevis pins and all of our mast hangs and clevis pins up on the mast. So we're good to go for ever as far as the chain plates and the bow roller assembly is. We, we get most of our titanium from Allied Titanium up in Washington State. There's an article I wrote for Practical Sailor explaining the use of grade five titanium in the marine environment. So if you go to Practical Sailor and just search for titanium, that article will come up. It'll tell you all that you could possibly want to know about titanium use on your sailboat. While I'm up here at the chain, I'll point out these little marker flags. They're made of spinnaker material. At one end of this strip, I just cut a little slice in the material and then put the tail end through the link in the chain, bring that back up through that little slit in the cloth material and pull tight. And then a wire tie securely holds it in place. I put a couple extra wire ties on the chain links, wire ties, they all fall off eventually and I don't want to lose our markings. I put these marks every 50 feet and there's no problem at all with these flags or the wire ties going over the gypsy of the windlass. And this windlass, this is a low Franz Tigris. It's been on this boat since we left Rhode Island over 12 years ago. Uh, no problems at all. It's been a very good, reliable windlass. The Tigris is so powerful that it can even pull up other people's old anchors along with our own anchor and chain. This Pro Furl roller furling system, the NC42, November Charlie 42, and the smaller one for the stay sail, the NC32, have been on Brick House for eight years. They've seen many thousands of ocean miles, hard use miles, and they have many more thousands of miles of use left in them. I highly recommend the Pro Furl roller furling systems. They have been upgraded, so they don't make the NC series anymore. These titanium screws, have been replaced with another system and the housing is built a little differently so it's even a better more robust profile system i would certainly buy profile again we have three different running poles on the boat a small one is two and a half inch diameter it's 11 feet long i use that as a whisker pole for holding out the jib when the wind is light and the waves are still up and it helps to keep the sail from snapping around too much. The next larger pole is a three inch diameter and that length is two feet shorter than the J dimension. I would like to have it at least equal to the J dimension and that's a nice easy pole to use. Sometimes I use the topping lift and forward and after guy depending on the weather and how lazy I am that day. Sometimes I just manhandle it and shove it out on the clue of a sail and then put it up here on the ring on the mast. The monster pole I just don't like to use is up here on the mast. It's a four inch diameter. It's just far too heavy for this boat and that certainly requires a topping lift for and after guys. Varnishing teak has really gotten old. The only time this boat was a marina queen is when we left Rhode Island and I took pictures of it because I knew it never looked that good again. But all these teak handrails, I eventually sanded down, primed and painted, and now they are low maintenance. The one mistake I made was taking out some of these 
T-can rails and replacing them with stainless steel. There's absolutely no advantage. Now we polish stainless steel every once in a while. Take a look at the shiny teak on the cockpit combing. There's some things on this boat that are very low maintenance and yet will always be a marina queen. Up here just in front of the mast is a nice box to carry all of the chain and line for the spare anchor. I put a fuel hose in there for the 60 gallon fuel tanks and a couple extra bungees for the sails, sail ties, and a couple odds and ends. These wires that run horizontally around the boat, I call them trippers. I could never call them lifelines. They're 24 inches high and just the perfect size, just the perfect height to send somebody right over the side. It's rare that I ever lean up against these wires. Why are they 24 inches high? Because way back when this boat was designed, designers were following the racing rules. And those rules for ocean racing said that lifelines had to be a minimum of 24 inches high. And that's so a crew, a racing crew, can sit on the side of the boat, leg hang, and put their arms up and over very comfortably on the top of the wire. Eventually, the racing rules required a second wire below that to keep the crew from sliding off the boat and into the ocean. So certainly, 30 inch, I would say, would be the absolute minimum for a lifeline height. Certainly higher than that would be better up around hip height. And of course, designers don't like to put anything that high because of cosmetics. There was a design hiccup with the Valiant 40. The mast was placed eight inches too far aft, which causes a bit too much of a weather helm. To counteract that, our mainsail is cut with no roach. So it's a straight shot from the clue straight up to the peak of the sail, and that helps to bring the center of effort a bit further forward. The reef hook on the starboard side, I just took off the port side reef hook, took that down to a welding shop here in Tanzania and had a duplicate made for the starboard side. I just had to give up another barb from a spear gun head. They couldn't duplicate that barb. And that barb, of course, helps to hold the dog bone ring onto the reef hook. It cost me $24. Most of that was for the materials. This line is for the spinnaker halyard that holds up the dinghy at night. And the blue line is the main halyard. Now that goes back to the cockpit, the same as the reefing lines, but I hardly ever raise the sail from the cockpit. It's far easier to do it at the mast. And I can just reach up and hang on to the halyard and help use my body weight to raise the sail. Much easier that way than sitting back in the cockpit, pulling and yanking, and then trying to crank it the rest of the way up. We have this one two-speed winch on the starboard side. There's another two-speed winch on the port side for the, uh, for the stay sail and the jib halyard. I really like the cutter rig. So, that's with the, so that is with the stay sail just aft of the jib. And of course, it's on the profile roller furling. It gives us a lot of variety, quick sail changes out in the middle of an ocean, depending on the weather conditions. So we can run both head sails at the same time if we're hard on the wind and the wind is light enough to warrant it, or we just use one sail for off the wind. The one thing is when we do come about, I try not to let a jib sheet drag over the stay sail, and that can really cause some serious chafe problems. On some boats, I haven't seen it on a Valiant 40, but the stay sail will not be on a roller furler. It'll just be a wire by itself on a lever. So you can put it in place and attach it and then hank on the stay sail. And when the sail isn't needed, the wire is disconnected with that lever and then brought back to the mast and stored at the mast. A very convenient way. Although, of course, that does take up more space down below for another sail to be stored. But I like the convenience for ocean crossing. They have both sails up on roller furlers ready to go. On our Valiant 40, we have the Tides Marine Sail Track. I like it a lot. It makes it easy for raising the main sail, but especially if I have to drop the sail in an emergency, I can just let go of the main halyard and everything comes down at a very measured clip without crashing down as though something is gonna break. It's been on the boat for about eight years now. It's showing a little bit of UV, ultraviolet ray deterioration, but nothing serious. It still has a lot of life in it. Possibly when we haul out in a few months in South Africa, we'll change it 
and put on a new sail track. There is a good chance once we leave South Africa, we'll be sailing down to Tierra del Fuego. We'll be out in the middle of nowhere and we just want to make sure we install any equipment on this boat well in advance of any potential problems. Coming to the stern of the boat on the port side, we have a big solar panel. And then to help supplement that, we have the KISS, K-I-S-S, -S, wind generator. That's been on here for 12 years now. And we have rebuilt it once with new bearings and bushings and all kinds of other things on the inside. So it's adequate. Uh, if we knew that we're gonna be out here for over 12 years of cruising, we thought we were only gonna be away for four years. We would have spent more money and gotten a different wind generator that puts out more energy at a lower wind speed and doesn't cut out at a higher wind speed, like around 20 knots. This one overheats at a little over 20 knots and then cuts out and it has to cool down before it starts producing electricity again. So it has a very narrow range of wind velocity for uh, adequate amperage output. But it's been on the boat doing its job um, if it ever falls apart, then we'll replace it with a different kind of wind generator. This is our water catchment system. The cloth bimini over the cockpit, the water runs down and onto the hard top of the dodger, and it all runs down then into this plastic gutter. This is actually a very thin wall PVC pipe that has been cut lengthwise, and it's held in place with one, two, three, four screws, and then sealed along the top edge with some sealant. And this rope, this rope sits in here and then through surface tension, it runs down the rope and into a bucket that we secure down here by the combing. Along this entire side deck, the only drain, the single drain was right here. That's barely a leak. So we had to install scuppers to help drain this side deck much faster. We put a scupper here, another scupper here, and then another scupper just as far back as we could. Without these scuppers getting water off that side deck, when we're hard on the wind and waves and water crashing over onto that side deck, water would jump that combing and fill up the cockpit. There's one little drain hole off to the starboard side underneath that winch handle holder and another little one on the far side. This boarding ladder is not original to the boat. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rungs, each 12 inches apart. And it's simply held in place with this hook. And I'm very surprised in even the worst weather, it's never been pushed off and over the side. So I certainly do have to remember to tie it up next time we get in a bad storm, just to be absolutely sure. So it's simple, just unhook it, throw it over the side. It's on an articulating hinge up here. That's a half inch bolt. And on the inside, it's a one size larger bolt that's mounted through on this little spacer and a washer. So we have a man overboard strobe, self-deploying EPIRB, and if you want to lose your horseshoe ring, mount it on the outside of the stern rail. Definitely, large waves will come and wash it away. It should really be stored inside of the stern rail, away from the weather. This stern anchor has come in handy plenty of times in anchorages to keep our bow into the waves and the chain for that is stored way down here. We have a lot of chain and about 150 feet of nylon road. That's 3 8 inch chain. What a great idea that the designer came up with. Underneath here is the propane locker with two barbecue sized tanks. What are they, about 20 pounds each? And we haven't had any trouble filling these tanks anywhere in the world. There have been a few places we had to look a little harder for somebody who had the proper adapter to fill the tanks, but otherwise it hasn't been the headache that we first imagined it might be. This little tank is for this barbecue. We thought that would be cute to have when we first left Rhode Island. We hardly ever use it anymore, and I would really just as soon get it off the boat. This is a very old yacht specialties pedestal. After all these decades, it's still operating. It's in great condition, which is a testament to how well built they were. The only problems are with these covers for the compass. The plastic always breaks on the inside, so I've had to take it sanded down and coat it with fiberglass mat and a lot of resin, little plastic knob on top, and now it'll last forever. Originally, 
The engine control panel was mounted flush to the outside of this combing on the port side. So what I did was make a one inch spacer to recess it inside of the combing and then added this plexiglass on a hinge to help shed water off of the control panel. Certainly a much more seaworthy design. But with, so we have a newer self-tailing winch for the main sheets, uh, larger, older style winches that never get used now since we don't have a spinnaker. And these are the original, this is the original winch for the stay sail sheet. And then we have all the brakes for the main sheet, main halyard, and of course all of the reefing lines. Come back to the brakes here in the cockpit. And all of our instruments, speed, depth, and wind are battery operated, wireless. Okay, this little thing is actually a step, so we can stand on that and then see over the top of the hard dodger after we roll up the bimini. And then down here on the floor are the two drains for the cockpit. Originally when I came on this boat they were just tiny little holes and I enlarged them just as large as I could make them. My restriction was just below here is the steering quadrant. So the elbow that was required, the 90 degree elbow, is now clearing that quadrant by one eighth of an inch. Otherwise I'd love to have made these holes even bigger. But then I went ahead and added a third drain right through the, this back panel of the cockpit. And if we ever got in any kind of serious wave situation filling the cockpit, I'll probably be kicking myself for not adding about another three of these drains straight back through the aft section of the cockpit. So mounted on the stern is the monitor wind vane. It's been on here since we left Rhode Island. It's been a fantastic machine, doesn't use any electricity. It steers a pretty good course when we're out in the middle of an ocean and certainly saves on a lot of energy. The Raymarine Autopilot has been a very powerful, reliable piece of equipment. I couldn't imagine sailing long term and crossing oceans without both an autopilot and a monitor self-steering vane. In very bad weather, water has washed into the cockpit and filled this cubby hole, forcing water down into the engine room blower vent. So I need to figure out a way to put a piece of plexiglass or something else quickly over that area to help keep big waves from washing into this area. Please use a hatch keeper like this when a hatch is open. I once watched a person sitting next to an open hatch knock it with their elbow. It came down and nearly guillotined their fingers. Blood went flying everywhere. Oh, look what we have here, a, a kitten. <laughs> this is one of Lily's favorite hiding places. She can go way back in here and nobody will bother her. Nobody could ever find her. And she can have a very good sleep. Where she's going now, way back and around, that's where the stern chain is stored for the stern anchor. And that white box is the propane locker box. There's a lot of space way back in here. It's a very large locker with shelves. It goes very deep all the way down to the hull. And there's a similar locker on the port side. Well, this video is pushing 24 minutes long. I never intended it to be that long. If you could leave a comment down below, what is a good length for these videos? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, is this really too long? That'll be a big help for me. Well, I do hope that the information in this video was worthwhile for you. If it was, please, down below or wherever it is on the screen, um, click the thumbs up and especially the subscribe button. That'll be a big help also. Okay, thanks a lot and we'll see you for part two in a couple of weeks.